Hi, everybody. Welcome back to Environmental Organic Chemistry with Dr. Lisa. We're going to continue our discussion of thermodynamics by talking about the concept of fugacity. Fugacity is a funny word. It comes from some Latin term, and it, it's, it's defined as the urge to flee. So if you're feeling like you want to run away from this class, you're experiencing fugacity. Oh, bad jokes. Anyway, um, so uh, we were talking about the chemical, right? The chemicals urge to flee. And again, we're anthropomorphizing. We're talking about chemicals as though they're people and they have urges. Um, uh, but fugacity is basically how happy the chemical is in its environment. And when we say happy, we mean how much energy? Is it in a low energy state? It's happy, it's comfortable. It it's, doesn't take much energy for this compound to stay where it is, right? Um, and fugacity is kind of like temperature. And I'll explore that more in the next slide where I kind of show you the difference. But so at equilibrium, everything would have the same fugacity. The chemical would have the same fugacity in all phases, in the water, the air, the sediment, everywhere it would have the same fugacity. Even though the water, the air, and the sediment might have different concentrations of the chemical. And so that makes it like temperature in the sense that at equilibrium, everything has the same temperature, even though they may contain different amounts of heat. Right. So in the next slide, uh, we give an example of how this works. So let's say we have a liter of air over here. Um, and at, at the start, let's say it's at zero degrees Celsius. Doesn't matter. Could be a 25. Who cares? Um, it's at some constant temperature and there's zero benzene in it. So the fugacity, lowercase f, the fugacity of benzene is zero. Uh, and at the same time, we also have a liter of water over here. It's also at zero degrees C. It's just above freezing. It's not frozen. Uh, the fugacity of benzene is also zero because there's no chemical present. So if I want to raise the temperature of this liter by one degree Celsius, I don't have to add very much heat to increase it, right? I only need 0 0.001 joules of heat to raise the temperature of a liter of air by one degree Celsius. But I need a whole lot over 2,000 joules of heat to raise the temperature of one liter of water by one degree Celsius. But when we're done, both of them have the same temperature. They're at equilibrium. If they were in contact with each other, the heat, the net movement of heat, well, there would be none. You know, it's not like one is heating up and the other is cooling down because they're at the same temperature. And by the same token, if I wanted to raise the fugacity of the benzene up to the saturation point, uh, the saturation point would be 10 to the 4.1 pascals, because again, we're using um, the pressure as our sort of vantage point, uh, our, our measurement of fugacity. We're going to measure it in pressure units. So to bring it up to saturation, I would add 0 0.005 moles of benzene to this liter of air, and that would get the fugacity up to 10 to the 4.1 pascals. But in the water, I need to add more. I need to add 0.02 to two moles, about four times more benzene to the water to get the fugacity up to 10 to the fourth pascals, right? So even though I added different amounts of benzene, they're both going to be at saturation. They're both going to be have equivalent fugacity so that there would be no net movement of benzene between the air and the water, assuming that these two things were the, the two liters of air and the liter of water were connected, were in touch with each other. So again, fugacity, it's kind of like temperature and it's the urge of the chemical, the desire of the chemical to get out of whatever phase it's in. So if you measure fugacity in Pascals and you find that the fugacity is higher over here in the air uh, than it is in the water, then the net movement, if the fugacity is higher here, then the net movement would, of the chemical would be from the air to the water. And, and uh, so that's how you use fugacity to determine what is the net movement, what's the desire of the chemical to flee from one compartment or another. So I mentioned that we need to have a reference state and typically the reference state is the gas phase. Um, and that's why we set the fugacity again, lowercase f here it's now in uh, cursive italics. But anyway, the fugacity is basically defined as the partial pressure of the chemical in the gas phase that would be at equilibrium with whatever phase you're dealing with, whether it's water or sediment or whatever. Um, so we use the, the, the gas phase as our reference state. And pressure and therefore fugacity is, is I, I don't know if I would use the word easy, but it's measurable, unlike chemical potential mu, which is not measurable. 
So that's why we use fugacity because you can actually measure it. You measure it in Pascal units. You can compare the fugacity between different compartments and decide which one has higher fugacity. And that tells you that the chemical wants to flee that compartment and head into the other compartments until they all get to the point where they have the same fugacity. So for pure liquids and solids, the fugacity, so here's the L, it's capital L for the pure liquid, lowercase i for your chemical. Fugacity of your chemical in the liquid phase is the, the saturation vapor pressure. The star here means that we're at saturation. Saturation vapor pressure of your chemical I when it's in contact with the pure liquid I. And then you also have here your activity coefficient. Activity coefficient, these little squiggly gamma things. You may be familiar with those if you took water chemistry. You frequently would calculate uh, activity coefficients from things like the Debye-Huckel equation and stuff like that. Um, <clears throat> so we're going to use those in environmental organic chemistry as well. <clears throat> so the fugacity of your chemical, if it's in its pure liquid phase, is its saturation vapor pressure multiplied by its activity coefficient. Same thing is true if we're in the solid phase here. The fugacity is equal to the, the saturation vapor pressure at equilibrium with the solid um, multiplied by its uh, its activity coefficient. But the thing is, when we're in the pure liquid or solid phase, the activity coefficients are assumed to equal one because we're in ideal behavior. So those activity coefficients are one. We could just ignore them, but you know, we like to draw them there for completeness, completeness so that you remember <clears throat> that they are there. And we'll see why in, in the next couple of slides. Uh, but the fugacity then of your chemical in something other than the pure phase, like let's say it's in some sort of liquid like an aqueous solution, then the fugacity of your chemical, chemical here is equal to, again, activity coefficient multiplied by the saturation vapor pressure. But now we've also multiplied by the mole fraction concentration here. That's what the X stands for. It's the mole fraction concentration of your chemical in this liquid. Uh, and because we've already defined the pressure as being equal to the fugacity, we could write the same equation, but using fugacity. And the trick here is that when you get outside the pure liquid or solid phase, now the activity coefficients are no longer equal to one. And the, um, the fact that it's not equal to one is, is a reflection of the fact that things are not ideal. And when you get higher than one, things are very uh, non-ideal in a bad way, that there, this is a, a chemical, the chemical's not happy, quote unquote happy, the chemical is not happy in that phase when it has, has a high activity coefficient. And if the activity coefficient is less than one, which it is occasionally, then that means that the chemical is ultra happy there and would rather be there than be in its pure liquid phase. So here's a bunch of examples. This is the solute, solute, and then down here are the solvents. These are the liquids and these are the chemicals that are dissolved in those liquids. Uh, so let's say we take something like hexane, which is C6H14, just a straight chain alkane, and we dissolve it in another straight chain alkane, N-hexadecane, hexa and deca means this has 16 carbons. You dissolve hexane and N-hexadecane and the activity coefficient is pretty close to one because they're very, very similar to each other. They're both totally nonpolar straight chain alkanes. Um, and it's the same is also true for benzene and diethyl ether, but when you get to something like ethanol, Ethanol can hydrogen bond with itself. And so to take ethanol, when ethanol is in pure ethanol form, all the little ethanol molecules are hydrogen bonding with each other. And so to take them and then put them in a solvent like n hexadecane, you have to break up those ethanol to ethanol hydrogen bonds. And breaking that up takes energy and it's unfavorable. So you end up with an activity coefficient that's greater than one. Uh, here's uh, chloroform trichloromethane, also known as chloroform. Uh, activity coefficient is actually slightly less than one for some of these chemicals. That has to do with hydrogen bonding. We'll talk about that later. Um, but generally, these chemicals are pretty happy. But look what happens when you get down to water. Okay, water is the undisputed king and champion of all hydrogen bonding. Water is just nothing but hydrogen bonds. It's two hydrogens, hydrogen bonding with a bunch of oxygens. Uh, and when you put something, so it's extremely polar and also hydrogen bonding. And so when you put hexane into water, it's very unfavorable. Hexane doesn't hydrogen bond. It's totally nonpolar. It does, it's very, very different. And it feels very out of place and very unhappy. So you get this huge activity coefficient of 460,000. A little bit better for benzene, but still quite high. Even diethyl ether, 130, and even ethanol, 
3.6. So water is a very unique and different kind of solvent. Uh, most of the solvents that you would deal with in a, you know, in a chemistry lab, an organic chemistry lab, are non-polar or less polar than water. Water is extraordinarily polar and very, very hydrogen bonding. And so when there's a big mismatch between the solute and the solvent, that's when you get really high activity coefficients. Okay, so if we want to write an equation for the chemical potential of our chemical in, in whatever situation it's in, let's say it's an aqueous solution, we would write that as being equal to the ideal chemical potential of the chemical when it's in its pure liquid, plus this correction factor over here, which is RT natural log of the actual fugacity of the chemical in the system versus its ideal fugacity, which is the basically the saturation, the, the fugacity of the pure liquid. If the pure liquid was vaporizing, it would be uh, at saturation. So it's the ratio between these two that determines the difference between the real chemical potential and the ideal. And from this previous equation up here, you saw that you could substitute in some stuff for fugacity and you would end up with same equation here, except now here we have the um, mole fraction concentration, which is X and the activity coefficient, which is gamma. So now we can use this equation and we're gonna go here and start talking about what happens in a phase transfer process. Cause that's what we're gonna talk about a lot in this class is phase transfer, meaning the chemical moving from one phase like water to another phase like air. So let's say we're moving, here's chemical A and it's moving from air to water and it's, at, it's going both directions. So we have this double-sided arrow. So the chemical potential of our chemical A in the air is equal to its ideal chemical potential plus this correction factor. Here we have the mole fraction concentration in the air and the activity coefficient in the air. And then we also have the chemical potential of the chemical in the water here, capital A, little w for water. Um, and that's equal to, again, the ideal chemical potential plus RT natural log activity coefficient in water times mole fraction concentration in water. At equilibrium, these two would be equal, right? You'd have the same chemical potential in water as you do in air. So we could write that this way. We rearrange this a little bit and we get the natural log of the ratio of the concentration in air over the concentration in water is equal to this big ugly thing which has the two activity coefficients present in it. Okay, and you're asking me why don't you uh, cancel out the RT? Well, we need it, so we're not gonna cancel it out just yet. And so to get rid of the natural log, we take the exponent of both sides and we get, again, the ratio of the concentration of the chemical in air to the chemical ratio. Eh. The concentration of the chemical in air divided by the concentration of the chemical in water is equal to E to the power of this big ugly thing. And it turns out that this big ugly part right here is delta G, right? So, and this ratio is the ratio of products to reactants. And when we're at equilibrium, that would be the equilibrium constant, which we use a capital K for. Now we're putting a little apostrophe here because we're in mole fraction units and that's bizarre and nobody uses mole fraction units. So we just put a little apostrophe there to remind ourselves, but it's equal to E to the power of the minus delta G over RT. So this is just deriving an equation that you've seen many times before. And we know that delta G can be expressed as having both entropy and enthalpy terms. So that's where we get this part of the equation. So the equilibrium constant is related to the delta G of the reaction. We already knew that. And it has both enthalpy and entropy terms. All right, so let's look at some examples. So here's some examples of chemicals, hexane, benzene, diethyl ether, and ethanol. And in the first example here, they're in the gas phase. Okay, so you're taking them from your pure liquid state to the gas phase, because pure liquid is its normal state. These are all liquids at room temperature. And what does it take to get them into the gas phase? Well, it turns out it's not a huge amount of energy required. This is delta G, this is free energy, okay? But there's a lot of enthalpy. There's a lot of enthalpy. You have to put a lot of energy into the system to get these things to vaporize but you get a lot of it back because the entropy term over here is quite large and negative. And that's because you're taking chemicals that were you know, cheek by jowl knocking into each other in the liquid phase and you're setting them free. Fly, be free. And they're flying around and they're free and they have lots of entropy. So there's a big entropy increase that offsets a lot of the enthalpy that goes into the system in order to vaporize these chemicals. Now, if you take those same chemicals and you dissolve them in hexadecane, 
For hexane, the change in delta G is tiny. It's also true for benzene and diethyl ether. And that goes back to the previous slide where we saw that the activity coefficients were close to one because there's not much change, right? These chemicals are sort of equally happy in their pure liquid phase and also dissolved in hexadecane, which is why activity co coefficient is close to one. And the energy required to move them around is, is pretty small, close to zero. Um, and notice it takes a lot of energy to get things into the gas phase, but to move things from one liquid phase to another, eh, not so much. It does take some energy to get ethanol to dissolve in hexadecane here. That's why this is 26 kilojoules per mole. But again, that's because you have to break up the ethanol to ethanol hydrogen bonds, pull those apart, and then dissolve the ethanol in hexadecane. So that takes some energy. Uh, but those hydrogen bonds were you know, basically locking two ethanol molecules together, which was decreasing their entropy. So when you dissolve them, you actually get an increase in entropy because you're setting those two uh, ethanols free. They no longer have to hydrogen bond with each other. Now they're two free agents and could do whatever they want. And then to dissolve these chemicals in water takes a fair amount of delta G, a fair amount of free energy, especially for hexane, benzene, and diethyl ether, not so much for ethanol. And again, this reflects their um, activity coefficients. The activity coefficient for dissolving something like hexane in water was huge. Remember, it was like 460,000. Benzene was a little bit smaller. Diethyl ether was even smaller. And I think ethanol was around like three or four for its uh, activity coefficient. And that's because you actually get some energy back. These are negative. Notice how three of the four of these are actually negative. Uh, and that's because you now form hydrogen bonds. Um, between diethyl ether and water. Diethyl ether can accept a hydrogen bond but not donate one. So when you put it in with water, which can both donate and accept, now you form new hydrogen bonds and you actually get some energy back out of that. So that part of it's exothermic, but you lose entropy. Notice that the entropy terms here are all positive because of the hydrogen bonding, because hydrogen bonding bonds two chemicals together and reduces their entropy. So there's a lot of complicated stuff going on here, but the delta H, the delta S and the delta G can all explain the activity coefficients and why chemicals behave the way they do. The really important part of all of this is that it helps us understand how equilibrium constants change with temperature. And that's important because when you look up a Henry's law constant or a, a octanol water partition coefficient or vapor pressure or whatever, frequently you're gonna find it in a textbook or something and it's gonna be at 25 degrees Celsius. But the world is not at 25 degrees Celsius. Average temperature around here in New Jersey, you know, year round is about 15 degrees Celsius. Um, and obviously other parts of the world are much colder. If up in the Arctic, it's colder. If you're in Saudi Arabia, it's much warmer. So we need to know how to convert uh, equilibrium constants to some other temperature. So if you start at 25 degrees C here as your temperature one, then you can, you, you know K at temperature one, then you can calculate K at temperature two by knowing the difference in the temperatures. And notice because we're doing one over T, uh, these have to be in Kelvin, right? Because if you did them in Celsius, you might have like a you know minus 10 degrees Celsius here. You take one over that and things start to blow up. So these have to be in Kelvin. But anyway, it's the ratio of these, the, the, one, the reciprocal temperatures, the difference in the reciprocal temperatures here, right? Multiplied by delta H over R, where delta H is the enthalpy term the amount of energy it takes to move the chemical from one phase to another. So like if we're talking about Henry's law, it's the energy required to move the chemical from the aqueous dissolved phase into the gas phase. So this, this ratio here, right, depends on the delta H and every process will have a different delta H. I mean, we just saw this right here, right? Delta H was different for all of these different processes, right? So uh, you have to keep that in mind you, and figuring out what is the value of delta H here can be one of the hardest things that we have to do. You can look up your equilibrium constant at 25 degrees C, that's easy, but then figuring out what is the delta H, that can be really hard. And, you know, we'll talk about how we do that in, in the future, not in the next lecture. I was going to say the next lecture, but no, not then, but in the future.